Okay, we're uh, coming up on the May exam for level two. 65 days to go. And I've uh, reduced that by 28 days for your review. You've got 37 days to get through what you need to get through. And then you should be uh, in review mode or final consolidation mode. So let's have a look at uh, uh, the structure of the exam you'll be facing. It may help you in uh, designing a strategy of what you want to do. And then we'll look at some review strategies. Here are the sections, and there are 10 sections, and here are the weightings. And we're given ranges for the weightings. And uh, the questions, uh, you will have 44 questions in the AM, and you will have 44 questions in the PM. Each question is worth three points, but I don't know that the three points matter. There's 44 questions in total. Uh, all vignettes uh, on the exam are going to be either four or six questions. So um, I did some quick calculation to see all the different possibilities at which we could arrive at uh, 44 points. And we can have eight vignettes of four points and two of 12 to get to 44. You can have five of four points and four of six, or you can have two of four and six of six to get to 44. Since there are 10 sections, this is the only one that actually has all 10. If we drop down to 5 plus 4, you have 9 sections and an 8 section. So I don't think you're going to get 2 vignettes of 4 and 6 of 6. So it'll be either one of these. My leaning is towards 8 vignettes of 4 questions each, uh, 2 vignettes of 6. So for something like ethics, which is 10 to 15 points, uh, it'll be made up of either 8, 10, or 12 points. There can't be 9 points for ethics because... Vignettes are either four or six points. So there'll be two uh, vignettes of four. There'll be a four and a six or two vignettes of six. And then for the sections that are five to ten, you'll either have one vignette of four, one vignette of six, two uh, 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 vignettes at four questions each, or a four and a six. And uh, all the sections are either ten or fifteen uh, or five or ten. So it gives you some idea of the number of questions you're going to get. Again, for a quant, uh, you're not going to get uh, five or seven questions. It can't be done with combinations of fours and sixes. Um, so again, my thinking is, uh, you know, if you're going to ask uh, all ten sections, you can get that in if you have eight vignettes of four and two vignettes of six. That gets you to, to 44. Uh, that's about as close as we can get on uh, the number of questions that will be asked in each section is sort of just a range uh, like this for the 5 to 10 percent section and a range like this for the um, 10 to 15 point section. So if you target the middle of the range, uh, I think I think you'll be okay. So quant 5 to 10 percent, it's either a vignette of 6 or two vignettes of 4. I think that's probably where it'll end up. Not a lot more I can do on that. We don't really know what the uh, weightings are going to be uh, until until you actually write it. Um, there has been uh, a number of candidates, or there have been a number of candidates that have already received an email from Prometrix uh, re, um, rescheduling their exam date for May. We have a level three candidate uh, that uh, works for us uh, that was rescheduled from a Monday uh, to the Friday before the Monday, so uh, writing three days earlier. Uh, so, is it possible that you're going to be rescheduled or you may be rescheduled? Sure. Is it even possible that your center, depending on where it is, could be cancelled? Sure. But all of this is going to be center by center. So, it's not going to be, if you're looking uh, as we get closer to uh, CFAI making some sort of blanket statement about uh, cancellations, I don't think that's going to happen. I think uh, if a test center says, look, we can't, given the conditions, we can't, uh, we can't hold the exam. Uh, the list of candidates who are scheduled at that center will probably get a direct email from CFAI directly as opposed to big broadcast statements. So I wouldn't, uh, again, I wouldn't look to that. I would look to your center, whichever center you're booked in. I would look for them to be sending you an email if there's a problem. If there's a cancellation or whatever the case is, you'll probably get an email failing that. Well, then you're probably writing and you've probably got to show up, ready or not. And there has been, you know, in past years, 
when everybody showed up at the same place and wrote in the same hall, if you've, um, you know, you're at level two, you've been to the level one exam, it's not uncommon to see empty desks around you. They were all booked. All of those desks, none of them were fillers. None of them were, you know, for people who, you know, sort of just walked in off the street saying, hey, can I write? They were all booked. Those are people who just didn't show up, which, uh, you know, I don't think is a wise idea just not to show up. You're going to lose your exam fee anyways. Uh, so you may as well write. Uh, there's no downside to writing here. You get to see the exam. You get to see the types of questions on the exam, and you get to experience the exam center. This will be your first time in computer-based testing. So even if you're not prepared to write, you may as well go in. Um, again, you lose the exam fee. And if you have a subscription on our site, if you just decide to skip the exam uh, altogether, uh, you don't qualify for the one fee uh, to pass option. All of our subscriptions are one fee to pass, which means if you bought level two on our site, we carry you till you pass, but you actually have to write. You actually have to miss the exam, you, you know, write and say, well, look, I didn't pass the exam, have results that show you sat and you didn't pass the exam and we'll carry you, but just to not show up. Uh, no, we, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't offer the extension for that. Um, what you can do, if you're not prepared to write the full exam, write the exam that you want to write. You know, you, listen, life happens. You know, you may be looking at the next 65 days and you might be saying, given what I have to do, given the obligations I have in my life, I can't possibly see how I'm going to fit this in. Well, pare it down to two or three sections. You know, let's say that uh, you're going to do FRA, equity, and fixed income. And you're just going to know those three sections. You're going to say, that's the exam I'm going to write. I don't care about the rest. I'm going to write those three sections. So you go in and you do the best you can on those three sections. That's your exam are just those three. When you get your results, you know, you're expecting that you're not going to pass. There shouldn't be any surprise there. But have a look at how you did in those three sections. You can still, uh, um, you know, pull off a victory within defeat. So, you know, pick the sections that you think that you can do well on and write that exam. What it does is it reinforces to you that, you know what, it, it, I can do all 10. I, I've just proven to myself that I can do these three and I scored, you know, way above the minimum passing score in each of those sections. They were my highest scoring sections. Maybe you scored in the top 10%. But you demonstrate to yourself that this thing is, is beatable, that you've already done three, you've pared it down to an exam where you said, listen, if it were three sections, if the exam were only three, I can handle it, I just can't handle ten, then, then prepare as if it were three sections. You know, show up. It's a reconnaissance mission. Get as much information as you possibly can. Get a lay of the land. And do those three sections really well. Right? Focus on two or three sections. Write the exam you want to write. Uh, now, uh, here, yeah, you need to know this. You need to write both the AM and the PM to get a score report. If you only write the AM and you said, aha, everything was on the AM exam, I'm going home, you don't get a score report. Let's look at uh, some review strategies going into the close here. All right, let's look at uh, some things that we can do in the review period, these 28 days leading into the exam. The most common one thrown around is uh, mock exams. I'm sure you've even heard the expression mock till you drop. Uh, mock exams are better thought of as a benchmarking tool as, as opposed to a, a learning tool or an internalization or a consolidation tool. It's a benchmarking tool. It's meant to give you an idea of based on what you know, where do you stand in relation to 100%. And it's not an absolute benchmark either. It's a relative benchmark. It, it is relative to the author who wrote those particular questions. So, you know, you can have three different authors write a mock exam and you'll get three different uh, levels of difficulty. You know, some may write easy questions, some may write hard questions. Which one is closer to the real exam? No one knows. Uh, CFAI does not share that information with us, even though we have uh, uh, an approved status with CFAI and we pay our fees every year regularly and diligently. Uh, they give us nothing when it comes to the exam. They are tight-lipped and it's just a big black hole. You can ask, but you're not going to get an answer. So when I, uh, you know, see uh, some provider saying, you know, uh, our exams are as close to the real exam 
uh, as possible. They mimic the real exam. Uh, no, no one knows. Nobody knows the answer to that. It's, it's your best guess. So if you have a skill uh, uh, or are trained in assessment, you understand how to write at different levels of difficulty. Uh, and if you have two or three or four exams and you spread that difficulty around, uh, then you hope that your sampling of questions is on average representative of what the population would be, the population being, of course, the real, uh, the real exam. But nobody knows what's going to be on the exam. Nobody knows the level of difficulty. Nobody knows what readings are going to be tested, what LOSs are going to be tested. It's all just a guess. And there are some high probability guesses. You can look at some particular topics and you could say, well, look, there's going to be a question on this. That seems pretty obvious. Uh, and, but for all the other stuff, you know, you don't really know. Uh, we have found, uh, because we've had the, the level two mock exams online and uh, they're self-grading, so we get to see the average score for exams. And uh, for the December exam, if you were a level two candidate, you could not write the second mock exam until you write the first mock exam. So we got to see the progression in the average score per exam. And it limits out at three, uh, going from three to four uh, on average showed no improvement in the score. Uh, CFAI gives you uh, some uh, level two exams. I believe there's three half exams there. I got a question mark there because I really don't know. And again, you know, when it comes to the learning ecosystem, CFAI doesn't share that information with us. Um, on our site, uh, if you have a subscription on our site, there are three full exams, which is six half exams. They're all computer based and they're all set at 45 questions uh, per half exam. The real exam is going to be 44. We just put it to 45 only because of the way our vignettes worked out. We have fours, fives, and sixes in, in our questions. And, you know, it's not that important that, that you know, you mimic the, the structure perfectly. What's more important is that you devise a valid benchmark against which to assess yourself. And, and really, that's how you th should think of mock exams, is they're more of an assessment tool to benchmark where you are. I would not say, listen, for 28 days, I'm going to do nothing but mock exams. Um, they're not a learning tool. They're not an internalization tool. They're really just there to benchmark your performance. So do some, um, but you're certainly going to spend more of the time doing other things. These, I have three more things that are probably the most effective in terms of uh, internalizing things. Uh, narrating. And narrating means if you have some notes in front of you, you can read the notes or you can put the notes down and narrate. And that doesn't mean memorize and repeat back to yourself. It means um, to improvise around the bullet points. Whatever bullet points you have down there, they're meant to, you know, uh, highlight to you something you should know. Well, you don't have to repeat it exactly. Narrate around it. Can you read an LOS, go to the uh, beginning of the reading, and all the learning objective statements are there, A, B, C, D, etc. Describe, discuss, calculate, interpret, etc. Read the first one, describe X, Y, Z. Do it without looking at any notes. Just narrate it. Just imagine you're in co conversation with somebody, and somebody says, Hey, I got a question for you. Could you describe X, Y, Z? And you say, oh, sure, X, Y, Z is this and this and that. And just narrate and tell a story and tell as much as you know about it. When we tell our own stories, we remember them better than a list of facts. A list of facts is inert. We look at that, we say, okay, well, all I can do is memorize a list of facts. There's no narration here. There's no story. But if you can narrate it yourself and give examples, once you start giving examples, that's really powerful because we remember these because they have a theme, they have a story, they have, a, they have something going on that's more than just point A, point B, point C. So uh, narrate. Uh, if you have um, our subscription for the review videos, there are review PDFs that uh, you know uh, are LOS by LOS and get right to the point of each LOS. Narrate them, create your own audio files. Teaching, mentoring, or tutoring. This means that uh, you can go on to Reddit or onto our site in the comments section and, and look for orphan comments. Orphan comments are, you know, a question that's never been answered. Uh, and answer it. Uh, you will never learn more than when you're teaching someone else. And mentoring is a skill you're going to need. The ability to mentor your colleagues. Because if you're ever in a management position, you have to mentor 
the people below you. You have to be in a position where you've trained your own replacement because if you don't, you're not promotable. Um, the in-reading examples. So if we're looking for high probability uh, types of topics that would be tested, not high probability questions. I wouldn't look at the in-reading examples and say, aha, there's this, remember this question, you're going to get one just like it. But I would look at it in terms of this is a high probability topic because it's deserving of an example and a walkthrough. It's probably a high probability topic. Uh, and every reading is about 10 to 20 of these. Uh, so don't just work the problem um, and, and, and remember it, though. I mean, working through it is one thing and remembering uh, uh, it. You may even get to one where you say, well, I've done this one before. I know the answer is 56. And you remember the steps, but you're, you, you know, if it were brand new and you'd never seen it, could you do it? You're just remembering it. The best way to get around that, to say, look, I've seen all of these before, and I'm really just answering them from memory at this point, is to explain it. Don't just read it and say, okay, I know what the next line is going to be. Explain it to someone else. You know, reading an answer is one thing, but then looking up at this invisible other person across the table and explaining it to them. Imagine there's somebody across the table that is constantly saying, I don't get it. I don't get it. Explain it to them and imagine that their answer to you after they explain it is, I still don't get it. I still don't get it. If you're ever going to be a teacher or a professor in a university, I guarantee you every class you have, you'll always have one person that no matter how much you explain it, they'll still look at you and say, I still don't get it. Well, this is good training. You never know where you're going to end up, right? But imagine that there's somebody there and instead of, instead of just working the problem and getting the answer quietly in your mind, explain the answer. Don't just read the answer. All right, that's it.